the present here we go empty and then in jesus name i pray by the power and the blood of jesus christ we will see you in a new dimension you will speak to our hearts you will see to our ear by the power and the blood of jesus christ we will hear from you and your grace will be sufficient for us thank you O lord because you are the lord and answer prayer in jesus name we pray let's call upon the name of the lord let's call upon the name of the lord let's thank him let's glorify his name because of whom he is and who he will continue to be in our life let's thank him because of what he has done in the past let's thank him because of what he is doing in the present let's thank him because of what he's going to do in the future let's praise him he is the king he is the lord he is the mighty one in battle he has never left us alone he will not leave us alone let praise him. Let glorify his name. We fly on to thee. Oh Lord, we fly on to thee. Oh Lord, among the God, who oh, is like thee, glorious in holiness, faithful in praises. Doing wonders, hallelujah. Let's praise the Almighty God. Let's glorify His name. Let us know before him, no any other person. After him, there's no any other person. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the mighty one in battle. He has never changed. He will not change. Because of what he's doing in our life and what he will still continue to do. He is Lord of Lords. Came for King, the mighty one in battle. Let praise him, let worship his name. thank him because he has a purpose for our life and the dream the vision the mission by the power and the blood of jesus christ they will not die he is worthy of our praise let praise him
there's nothing we can do than worship him, glorify him. Let's open our mouth. Let's praise him. Let's thank him because of his presence in our services. Let's thank him because of his presence in our service yesterday. Let's thank him because of his presence in all other meetings we have been having. Let's thank him because of individual. Let's thank him because of the leaders, elders in the church. Let's praise him. Let's worship him. Let's thank him because of his glory upon us. Let's thank him because of his mighty hand upon us. He is worthy of our praise. Let's thank him that by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ this evening, we are going to see him. He's going to speak to us. Let's pray for all those people who are coming on their way. That God will bring them safely. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We shall open our in book to in 135. In Tell me the old story. Tell me the old story. Old story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory. Of Jesus and his hope. Of, and, of, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to a little child. For I am weak and weary and helpless and divine. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in, that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story of him, for I forget too soon the early day of morning. He passed away at noon. Tell me the story of softly, story softly, with earnest tone and grief. Remember, I am the sinner whom Jesus came to save. Tell me the story always, if you will really be in any time of trouble, a comforter to me. Tell me the same old story, when you have cause to fear that this world empty glory is costing me, is costing me too dear. Yes, and when that world is glory is done on my soul, tell me the old, old story. Christ Jesus make me the old.
Let us be seated. I welcome everyone of us to today's Bible study. And I want to remind us that uh, for everyone of us that we are prepared to wait, that we shall have the two hours night VJ after the Bible study of today. And as we are preparing to meet the Lord, God will meet us in Jesus' name. The Bible let us know that the prayer is a key and nothing shall be done without prayer. I just want to remind us that for those of, people, of many people, they may be watching us on other media like YouTube. YouTube, We have our Monday Bible study every Monday from 6.50 to 8.30. I said we have a long message from GS Pastor W.F. Kumoyi. And then we have our Sunday service every Sunday from 8.50 to 11.30. By the grace of the Lord, we are always have our prayer meeting online every Thursday from 6 to 7 o'clock. And then for anybody that need the number, the number is uh, on our program sheet. And then for those people who may need it online, it's 712-775-7035. Why the access code is 344823. We shall be glad as we are uh, journey together to call upon the upon the Lord to answer all our prayer, and by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, all our prayer will be answered in Jesus' name. It is my wish that by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we will not stop our effort in touching those people who are touchable, in whom touching those people who are untouchable, because with God all things are possible to bring more into the house of the Lord. And God is going to help us in Jesus' name. I will want to appeal to every one of us as Arrow and G. I mean, Arrow is sending messages about the strategist meeting in DC from February 16. Let's do all what we can do to be there. And God is going to compensate us, God is going to reward us as we are doing so in Jesus' name. If there's any other thing, I will let us know. Except that the challenges we are having in the car, or some of those that we'll be passing through, you will see that they are putting rejected on the car. Not the car is not good, but minor, minor thing. And then, for every one of us, God is going to bless us in Jesus' name. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, what is insufficient is going to be sufficient in Jesus' name. The grace of the Lord will be sufficient for every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's bring our Titan offering. Call upon the name of the Lord. As you are bring your tithe and offering, it's going to be accepted before God. That by the power in the blood of Jesus Christ, the grace of the Lord will be sufficient for you. The mighty hand of the Lord will be sufficient for you. All of us will not do it in vain. And the will of the Lord will come to pass in our life in Jesus' name. Let's call upon the name of the Lord. Multiply me. So that I can multiply people who are coming to the kingdom of God. And this is going to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. As our brother is passing the offering bag around, please remove him in, in, in remain in mode of prayer. Keep continue to pray for yourself. The Almighty Father, let me see you. As I come to the Bible study today, don't let me go empty handed. Let your grace, let your mighty hand be sufficient for me. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We shall read from our Bible reading, 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. And David numbered the people that were with him, and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. 
And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth. For if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die, will they care for us. But now thou art worth ten thousand of us. Therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do. And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Detei, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there was there a great slaughter that day of twenty thousand men. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. And Absalom met the servants of David. And Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it, and told Joab, and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Detei, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and all thyself wouldest have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand, and thrust them through the heart of Absalom, while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bare Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And Joab blew the trumpet, and the people returned from pursuing after Israel. For Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood, and laid a very great heap of stones upon him. And all Israel fled, every one to his tent. Now Absalom, in his lifetime, had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, Let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day thou shalt bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed himself unto Joab and ran. Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, but howsoever, let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But howsoever, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then the Hymaaz ran by the way of the plain, and overran Cushai. And David sat between the two gates. And the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall, and lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king. And the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and cometh with good tidings. And Ahimaaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt be as that young man is. And the king was much moved, 
and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Mm. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. May God bless us with his reading in our heart in Jesus' name. We shall listen to for your song.
Come and pray to us that God will touch you, God will touch me. We will not go as we come in Jesus' name. That um, as we go to speak about pardon, the Almighty God, we are going to receive the mercy, a burden one, from God Himself in Jesus' name. That the grace of the Lord will be sufficient for us, that the mighty hand of the Lord will be sufficient for us. Call upon Him, call upon Him. wanting to receive what you have for us. And therefore, Lord, we are praying and pleading that your spirit will impress your word upon us. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the Bible study session tonight. We come before you willing to learn, wanting to receive what you have for us. And therefore, Lord, we are praying and pleading that your spirit will impress your word upon our hearts, instruct and teach every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that these words will be quickened and made alive so that we'll be able to learn what you have for every one of us in Jesus' name. 
Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we continue our study from the book of the Psalms. And we're studying Psalm 32. I want to read with you from verse 1. Blessed is he who transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my running all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this, Shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found? Surely, in the floods of great waters, they shall not come near unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with beech and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. This psalm that we have read together just now, that we have titled, Pardon for the Penitent, was intended to instruct the soul under conviction how to find pardon, how to receive peace with God, and how to have the peace of God. It is to teach the sage that he is the one who has been pardoned, how he can be compassed about with the songs of the redemption, the song of salvation, the song of joy, and the song of deliverance. Here the psalmist teaches sinners to repent because he himself had tasted the blessing of forgiveness. That's what he promised or what he said in another psalm, in Psalm 51. Verses 12 and 13. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, after he had received forgiveness, after I was sure that his own transgressions had been rubbed away, blotted out, taken away, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And here, he gives lessons to all men, princes, priests, and people, everyone. To men, to women, and to children, to everyone. And it is important that the lessons we have in the psalm, we learn. In fact, without learning, this lesson as contained in this psalm, whatever other lessons in life we learn, will be unprofitable on the last day. The psalm is divided into four parts. 
to make us be able to grasp the lessons being taught in the psalm. Part 1, verses 1 and 2, pardon with conversion. Part 2, verses 3 to 5, the pangs or the pain of conviction. Part 3, verses 6 and 7, prayer with confidence. Part 4, verses 8 to 11, pleadings with all classes. That is, the pleading of the Lord with all classes of people. Let's look at point 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. As you look at the scriptures, especially when you read in the New Testament, you will discover that the nudget of the gospel, the core of the gospel, the centrality of the gospel message had been preached in the Old Testament, only that it is more clearly revealed in the New Testament. Here is the core of the gospel. Here is the message of justification by faith. And in fact, Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, when he discovered the truth that the just shall live by faith, he did all he could do to spread that message abroad in preaching, in writing, and in getting some people around him that he discipled that he passed the message of the gospel to, so that faithfully, they too, they could tell other people. In one of the times that he got them around, he always did it every day, we are told, by theologians and historians. And on one of these occasions or sessions that Martin Luther had the people around him, and they asked him a question. They said, in the Psalms, which of the Psalms will you consider as the greatest? And he said, the Pauline Psalms. That is, the Psalms that contain the revelation of the gospel as revealed unto Paul, the Pauline Psalms. And they wanted to know, they asked him, which of the Psalms will you regard as the Pauline Psalms? And the first he mentioned, he mentioned about four. The first that he mentioned is Psalm 32. Why did he mention Psalm 32? Because those two verses we have read contain the message of the gospel. In fact, Paul quotes quote it in Romans chapter 4. From verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know that the epistle to the Romans talks about the gospel, the message of the gospel. It's at the beginning of this epistle, the epistle to the Romans, that is said in chapter 1, verse 15. So then, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And immediately he began to preach the gospel to the Romans. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the gospel? Salvation to the one that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Further on, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so, he preached the gospel. And in the fourth chapter, which I have read to you already, he emphasizes again that righteousness comes not by works, not by generosity, giving money to the beggars, not by pharisaic attitude, trying to follow the rigid laws as interpreted by the Pharisees. And it is not by paying any amount of money to the church, to a club, or to the unfortunate in society. It is not by any religious ritual or rite that anyone will do or has done. We receive righteousness on the basis of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why he emphasized, and he said, even as David describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom the Lord imputed righteousness without works, without rituals, without generosity, without the good deeds, but just by faith in the Lord, it says in verse 9, Romans chapter 4, verse 9, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see, as I emphasized yesterday in the Sunday worship, that when you come to the Lord as a sinner, you come for a great exchange. You hand over your own sin unto the Lord, and he hands over unto you his own righteousness, not because of anything that you have done, not because of any good deed of your hand, not because of whatever you have done well in the past. It is only by the grace of God. Mercy unmerited. Grace unmerited. Favor unmerited. That the righteousness of the Lord is imputed unto you. Look at it from verse 22. Romans chapter 4. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So then, when we say that Jesus is our Savior, he doesn't look at all the good things we have done. The reason he saves us is that we are sinners. We have been sinners. If there is anything that qualifies us, qualifies anybody for salvation, it is a sin that you committed that made you qualified for salvation. It is the dirt that you had on you that made you qualified to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you are clean, 
you don't need the cleansing. If you are righteous already, you don't need his righteousness to be imputed and imparted unto you. If you are good already, you don't need the Lord and the Savior to make you good. But you will never be good enough yourself to make heaven. Your deeds will never be clean enough, many enough, to qualify you to make heaven on your own. And knowing that everybody is unqualified and disqualified because of our sins, because of our guilt, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but he has everlasting life, eternal life. So then, all you need to do is to come under the covering, the shelter, the refuge provided by the blood of Jesus. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verse 30 and verse 31, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. To give, to give, not to pay. Because we're not buying it. We're not qualified for it. He gives repentance and he gives forgiveness of sin. It is a gift. It is by the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have the forgiveness of sins, not according to the abundance of our good works. Not according to the height of our knowledge. Not according to the greatness of our generosity. Not according to the spotlessness of our self-righteousness. But in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That is why it's the good news, the glad tidings, the gospel, that whosoever will may come. None is so poor, none is so sinful, none is so depraved that he cannot come. The mercy of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God invites everyone, whosoever will may come. Pardoning mercy is of all things the most to be prized or to be valued. For it is the only way to happiness. Self-righteous Pharisees have no part, have no portion. In this blessedness, it is over the returning prodigal that the word of welcome is pronounced. That the full instantaneous pardon is given. It has cost the Lord our Savior his very life, the shedding of his blood to bear our sins away. In Christ's atonement, we have propitiation. That is the covering, the taking away of our sin, the making an end of our sin. Let's go back to Psalm 32. Verse 2. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. That means, the moment you are born again, the Lord does not have any iniquity in your account anymore. He looks at you now as if you never, never, never sinned. Your mind may remember your sins once in a while. God never remembers. Even unbelievers and neighbors may point at your past old way of living. God never remembers anymore. 
the people you offended, even when you have made right everything according to the grace of God in your life, they may still remember because they are human beings, but God imputeth not iniquity or sin or transgression to the one who has truly, genuinely given himself to the Lord and has claimed the grace of God, the righteousness of the Lord. And it says, in whose spirit there is no guile, free from guilt, is also free from guile. Let's go to point two. From verses three to five, the psalmist now looks back a little. It tells the story of what happened to him before he received pardon, before he received forgiveness. He had been under conviction before his conversion. Let's look at it. Psalm 32, verses 3 to 5. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my running all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee. My iniquity have I not heed. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest mine the iniquity of my sin. I want you to notice here that the psalmist was talking in the past tense. Look at verse 3. When I kept silence, it was something of the past. It was only retelling the story to help other people that might be in the same predicament. Look at verse 4. Day and night, thy hand was heavy. It was something of the past. And in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin. It was something of the past. What he was saying is this. When sin came into his life, by carelessness, he said he did not immediately and promptly confess and forsake. He tried to cover it up. But then he remembers now that when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my running all the day long. It was the pain of conviction, the pangs of conviction. And he told the experience so that he can instruct other people to be quick, to be prompt, never to delay in giving up their simple ways. Sometimes through neglect, sometimes through the discouragement and despair, the sinner fails to confess immediately and to seek pardon from the Lord. At such a time, there will be grief. And the grief may become so intense as to sap its health and destroy its vital energy. That's what the psalmist is saying. He said, the sin, the conviction, the pain, the pangs were killing me, destroying me. They were like a loathsome disease within my spirit, like fire in my bones. The pain of conviction was so much, he describes it in another place, in Psalm 38. Psalm 38, from verse 2. For thine arrow stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me so. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sins. That is what happens to a man or to a woman who is living in sin. But the Spirit of God has been striving with that soul, convicting that soul. There will be no soundness in the flesh. It will feel the heavy hand of the Lord. Conviction will look like arrows fastened to the heart or to the mind. It will bring sorrow. It will bring despair. 
it will bring so much conviction that it will be terror in his heart. In verse 4, for my iniquities are gone over my head. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my lungs are filled with a loathsome disease. And there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and so broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness in my heart. That is the burden. That is the feeling. That is the pain. That is the terror that the backslider or the sinner feels until he becomes penitent, repentant. And he goes before the Lord to confess and to forsake a sin. Verse 17. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. That conviction is to lead to repentance. Is to lead to confession and forsaking of the sin. So that eventually the sinner or the backslider comes, driven by the hand of God, convicted by the Spirit of God, is driven to his knees to say, I will be sorry for my sins. I will confess. Acts chapter 2. Verses 36 and 37. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God has made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Peter spoke to these people, the Jews. He reminded them of what they did against the Lord, against Christ, the Prince of Life. The Son of God, Christ the Messiah. And as he painted the picture before them, that they crucified the Lord and the Christ, the picture of their wickedness passed before their face again. The picture of their evil, of their hatred, of their malice, of their false witnessing, of the betrayal came on their mind again. The picture of the sorrowful dying Christ on the cross of Calvary came before them again. The picture of how they nailed him to the cross with brutality and wickedness, with envy and jealousy. All the evil things they did to the Lord, against the Lord, sinning against the light, it came before them again. And it brought conviction, pain, sorrow terror, arrows of the Lord in their heart. That's why it says in verse 37, Now, when they heard this, they were preached in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When you feel the conviction of sins committed, sins unconfessed, Sins not pardoned yet. That's what it does in the heart. It makes you to go before the Lord in great, deep agony of sorrow for sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent. What Paul the Apostle is saying here, if you do not understand the way he uses the word repent two times, you may be feeling that he contradicted himself. What happened is this. The Corinthian church had allowed sin in their midst without checking the sin, judging the sin, casting out the sinner, dealing with the offender. A young man had lived in immorality with the father's wife. 
They knew about it. They did nothing about it. And Paul wrote a strong, stern letter unto them. He rebuked them. And then he said, I do not repent for doing that. Because I needed to do that to bring you under conviction. But then he said, although I felt sorry, I felt sad, I felt unhappy because they were his children in the Lord. His commission or his commitment was always to make them happy, to show his love to them. So he said that he was sad and sorrowful. He was unhappy that he needed to write unto them in such a firm, stern manner. That's why he said, though I did repent, though I felt unhappy the way I wrote unto you. But then he said, on the other hand, I do not regret. I do not repent. Because I knew that I should have written something like that to you. Verse 8, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice. Not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. For behold, they self same thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sword. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea. What zeal, ye, what revenge. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What Paul the Apostle is saying is this. When he received the letter that contained his message, that told them they were puffed up, they had not done right, that now they should purge out the old leaven, that they may become unleavened, and clean and pure before the Lord, they were sorry. They felt convicted. The arrows of conviction was fastened into their hearts. They were so sorrowful, and it brought real conviction within them. But that made them to pray. That made them to put right the things that were wrong. And then Paul said, they became careful after that. They walked carefully. They looked carefully. They searched carefully in their midst. If there was any sin, they dealt with it now before Paul will talk to them sternly again. They cleared themselves. They had indignation against sin. They had fear. They wanted now to walk out their salvation with fear and trembling. They had vehement desire and zeal for the Lord now. And then they revenged on the devil. The time that he had wasted from them. The attention that he had taken. And they revenged on sin. They put sin away firmly in their midst. So he said, the conviction did something good in you. Let's go back to Psalm 32. From verse 6 and verse 7. Prayer with confidence. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee. In a time. When thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters. They shall not come near unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Now, the psalmist, looking over the whole experience, the period of conviction, the time of confession, 
and the experience of conversion with iniquity taken away, transgressions removed, forgiveness given, redemption made available, righteousness given unto him, given to his account, imputed unto him. Now, with the peace of God in the mind, he rested, he relaxed, he rejoiced in the Lord, and he now speaks about a testimony. And he encourages other people as well. And he said, for this, because of this grace of God, this mercy of God, this pardon by grace, favor unmerited, everyone that is godly shall pray unto thee. It encouraged him to pray, and it was encouraging other people to, they ought to pray. But then, he also mentioned something very important. That they will pray in a time when thou mayest be found. One, he was referring to the fact that he found the Lord. He found mercy from the Lord. He prayed at the right time. It wasn't too late for him. Mercy was still available when he prayed. And in that, he encourages you and encourages me that we ought to pray when mercy is still available. There are some people that will pray too late. Like the rich man in hell. He lifted up his eyes. He asked for mercy. He asked for water. He asked for the cooling of the tongue. It was too late. Then he asked for Lazarus to please go. And speak a word. A word that will bring conviction to the people back at home. He prayed too late. Like the song that we sing. The wailing and the weeping. And it talks about the people. They prayed but their prayer was too late. And so here. The psalmist was saying pray. But don't let it be too late. Seek the Lord at a time of mercy. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 and verse 7, Seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call ye upon him, while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And let him do that, while the Lord may be found today. And let the righteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him do that today. While the Lord may be found. Let him return unto the Lord. When? Today. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 2. For he says. I have heard thee. In a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I so called thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Psalm 32. On the account of God's pardoning mercy. The grace and the favor of God unmerited. The psalmist became hopeful, and more trusting. Remarkable answers to prayer, quicken the prayerfulness of other godly persons. Where one man finds a golden nugget, others will feel inclined to deal. The benefit of our experience to others is very great. And here David made the benefit of his own experience available to other people. He said, I sought the Lord I found mercy from the Lord. You too, you can pray. He said, I sought pardon. You too, you can seek the pardon of the Lord. But he said, I sought it at a time of mercy. I sought it, I did not delay. I sought it, and I sought fervently from the Lord. You too, you can seek. But he does not only have an encouragement from believers for sinners. He asks for believers, for godly people. And he says, you can seek the Lord for other things too. 
like sanctification or the holiness experience. But seek in time, don't delay too long. And after you have been sanctified, you can seek the Lord to and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But seek on time, don't seek too late. Or if you need to be strengthened, encouraged, and empowered to walk in the way of the Lord, seek for the strength of the Lord. But seek in time, don't seek too late. Or if there is responsibility God has given you, like the responsibility of making right things that are wrong in your life, and you need the grace of God to do it, seek in time, don't seek too late. That's why he said, for this, on account of the mercy of God that I receive, everyone that is godly can pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. He tells us, we shall seek while we can find him. Wise people will pray while the Lord has promised to answer. Those who are not wise postpone their petitions till the master of the house has risen up and he has shut the door. And then their knock is too late. Between the time of sin and the day of punishment, mercy rules the hour. That means mercy is available and God may be found. But when, once the sentence has gone forth, pleading will be useless. Therefore, sinner, do not slight the accepted time. Pray without delay. Backslider, do not waste the day of restoration and salvation. Do not delay any longer. Call upon him while he may be found. And then will there be the song of joy, the song of redemption, and the song of salvation, the song of redemption and deliverance in your mouth. That brings us to the last point. From verse 8, pleadings with all classes. That is, pleadings with all classes of people. I will instruct thee. And teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. The Lord here was talking to the pardoned sinner. To the returned prodigal son. To the restored backslider. And if you are wondering, now I am forgiven. Now my sins have been taken away. Now, my iniquities are not remembered anymore. Now, the Lord has imputed righteousness unto me. How will I live? How will I work? How will I behave? What will I do now? Because I want to live the rest of my life in the, to the glory of God. How will I be able to live now so that I do not get back into the mud, into the vomit? Into the dirt I left behind. Then the Lord says, I will instruct you. The Spirit of the Lord within you will be speaking within you, guiding you, saying, This is the way. What key therein? How does the Lord instruct? Look at Second Timothy chapter 3, from verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That's how the Lord guides. That's how he teaches. That's how he instructs. He reminds you of his word. And through his word, you're given the enlightenment and the grace to live a righteous life. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, from verse 9 to verse 11, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. After we have come to the Lord, after the backslider has been restored, the Lord promises him 
the believer, that he will instruct him and teach him in the way he should go. What way? The way of righteousness, the way of holiness, the way of integrity. And then in verse 9, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with beech and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. He now instructs another kind, another class of people. The people that hear the word of God, and they do not immediately respond. He's pleading with them. He's saying, do not be like the horse or like the mule, in whose mouth we have to put the bit and the bridle. He says, be quick in responding to the word that you have heard. Hebrews chapter 3, from verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is called today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, or the day of provocation. Here he pleads with people that appears to have been hardened, the people that neglect, the people that delay, the people that are waiting for chastisement from the hand of the Lord before they give themselves over completely. He says, be not as a horse. Do not wait for the thunder. Do not wait for punishment. Do not wait for chastisement from the Lord. Do not be like the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose house must be held in with beat and bridle lest they come near unto thee. And in Psalm 32, verse 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. He wants the people that are rejoicing in their wickedness, thinking that there is gain in their unrighteous, sinful ways. And he reminds them, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusted in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. He pleads with everyone that if you are yet to be saved, make this period, this time, this night, the day of salvation. If you are yet to be restored from your backsliding, make today the day of reconciliation with God, restoration unto the Lord. If you know that you have been indulging in one kind of sin or the other, do not wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow may be too late. Call upon him. If you will trust in the Lord, mercy is still available. And then in verse 11 he says, Be glad in the Lord. Remain in the Lord, then be glad in the Lord. And rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. It starts with the conversion of the believer, of the one that has given himself to the Lord. And he ends with commitment to walk in righteousness of heart, uprightness of heart and life. The Lord wants us to get this lesson very well and to call upon the name of the Lord at this time of mercy. We'll rise up on our feet now. We'll talk to the Lord in prayer. If you have been hiding your sin, call upon the name of the Lord. If you have been excusing your sin, call upon the name of the Lord. Do not allow the thunder of the judgment of God to strike. There is mercy today. There is favor today. The grace of God is available today. 
the blood of Jesus is still flowing freely for the people that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Restoration is still possible. Redemption is still possible. Call upon the name of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Are you a prodigal son? Return home. Are you a prodigal daughter? Return home today. Are you a backslider? Be restored into fellowship with Christ today. Do not neglect the mercy of God. Do not waste the day of mercy. Do not wait until judgment will come from above. Do not neglect the heavy hand of the Lord upon your heart, the conviction of sin in your heart. Let it lead you to repentance. Let it lead you to having the mercy of God and the grace of God. Pray while there is mercy. Call upon the Lord while he's near. While the conviction is deep and fresh on your heart, call upon the name of the Lord. And as the Lord is teaching and instructing and guiding you to walk in the way of righteousness, walk in the way of integrity, walk in the way of holiness, be obedient to the teaching. Oh Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Oh Lord, you are my God. You know, pray that the Lord God will search you with such light of His word. That every darkness will receive the light. And the light of this world that we've received will radiate in every area of your life. It will radiate in all manner of your conversation. It will draw you more closer in intimacy with God. It is righteousness, the righteousness of God, that he will not elude you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for your word is to correct, is to repute, to rebuke, and to mold us. Is to bring us, O oh God, to the consciousness of our purpose of living. To help us, O oh God, to, concent to concentrate on that which you have called us to do, on the life that you've called us to live. For I will ask this moment, any way that we have slept off the track, we ask for restoration. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will plant our feet in holiness and in righteousness that in the rest days of our life here on earth that heaven will be our priority and all that it will take us oh lord 
to achieve heaven we will have it in Jesus name father give us oh God your obedient spirit give us a broken and a contrite heart father we come against every stoning heart Father, we come against anything that will take us far away from you consciously or unconsciously. Father, we pray, O oh God, that your word we will meditate day and night. That we will do and observe all that you have written and all that you have commanded us to do. That at the end of time, rejection reproach and disappointment will not be our portion in Jesus name Amen. thank you Heavenly Father thank you because you are holy but thank you because you are wonderful but thank you for the light of God that you shine upon our lives we bless your holy name in Jesus name we we'll pray Let's share the grace and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Say to your neighbor, Keep yourself pure. 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 Keep y